right. Who's ready to get this done over here? I'm Nick Federoff. Thank you very much for tuning into this hour of the program where we talk about America's number one hobby, gardening, landscaping. I help you out with all of your indoor and outdoor living ideas. I'll even touch up on sustainability, environmental stuff. I refuse to hug a tree, though. I'll tell you right now, I am not a tree hugger, but we do whatever we can as far as it as far as uh, doing uh, things as what they call IPM. We use the integrated pest management approach. The IPM way of gardening is really pretty cool because it allows you to do things. It allows you to do, and you know what, Bradley? You're right. Things green is best. All right. So while I'm talking over here, if you, it seems like a fly came into the room and got my attention, and all of a sudden I start like like have this Tourette's thing. It's true because I have a, a very slow and horrible attention span. So Bradley just wrote down on our live feed over here, things green is best. Ha, you're right. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, we're here talking with you. Uh, and I forgot what I was talking about. It was really good. IPM integrated pest management. I cannot stress enough on how important IPM actually is. IPM, let's break this down real quick for integrated pest management. Okay, so the management part we can understand, right? We're doing things, we're managing whatever it is. Well, in this particular instance, we're using we're managing pests. Okay, so the pests actually encompass a lot of different things. They uh, a pest is not only an insect. A pest could be rodents. It could be mollusks. Mollusks are what? Snails and slugs. It could happen to do what with reptiles like snakes, uh, uh, small animals like gophers and squirrels and rabbits and pterodactyls. Dactyl and brontosauri, is brontosauri or brontosaurus says. Anyway, it has to do with that. Pests can also be things like weeds. Weeds are a pest. They're a problem. Okay, what else can this be? Uh, that's pretty much it. So you have the management of pests. Now, what does integrated, where does that fit into this? Integrated is how are we going to... Uh, how are we going to take and how are we going to manage the pests? We're going to do it and we're going to integrate it. We're going to integrate the fact that, uh, and we're going to integrate different things. Now, in integrated pest management, we start with the most non-invasive way of controlling pests. So you'll hear from me all the time. If you happen to have aphids on roses, this is one of the times we use a very non-invasive kind of way of controlling them, where we would take and we'd make up a soapy concoction, we douse, we spray the plant, whatever we do to it, to attack the aphids. Now, why does this happen to work? It works because we know the physiology of the aphid. It has an ectoskeleton. So when you end up taking and spraying, you end up taking and spraying the ectoskeleton, or I should say the uh, aphid, the stuff that gets left behind from the soap, which is the scum, dries up inside of their, uh, their, their body, inside their system. And it chokes them out and they die. So that's a part of integrated pest management. Do whatever you can as non-invasive as possible, things that aren't going to hurt the environment. Then we start to bring in other things. Because maybe sometimes the way to attack something is nothing more than with a hoe. And by chopping up and removing the weeds. So that's another non-invasive way. Now, we take and we build it up from there. Maybe we have a problem with caterpillars. 
Well, we have to bring in things like uh, maybe spinosad or maybe BT, you know, organic-like or organic materials. That's how we do something like this. Now, what if you have a chronic case of, say, spider mites? Spider mites can be extremely difficult to kill. And you can use all these options, and we want you to use all these options that I just talked about, the non-invasive ones, to kill these things off. Well, here, herein lies the problem. It might not work. It might not work at all. So we need to bring in chemicals, and we do it as safely as possible. We might bring in something like eight. Eight is a pyrethroid. And a pyrethroid is actually a derivative of marigolds. That's a good thing, but yet it's a chemical. If the eight doesn't work, maybe what we need to do is bring in a miticide. And a miticide is a little bit more heavy duty. So there's a lot of different ways that we could approach this through the integrated pest management way of gardening. And we have to be very methodic about this as well. We just don't want to say, okay, you have a weed problem. Why don't we just go ahead and nuke them? Well, that's not necessarily the best way to take care of something like this. We have an environment to worry about. Like I told you earlier, I'm not about hugging trees. But there's certain things we got to worry about. We don't want to take and spray something like, say, Roundup and spray it near a body of water, in a body of water, because that's going to kill all the fish. I have no problem using a glyphosate. I have a problem using it on a body of water. I don't want fish to die. So those are the things that we have to, we have to use. Oh, here's, a, here's a, an approach right here. Ian is talking, use neem oil for pests. Yeah, neem oil from the neem tree out of Africa. It's a great way of taking, hey, thanks a lot, Scott. Appreciate that. Uh, it's a great way of attacking insects and pests. Now, the thing that we have to remember is that if we're going to be taking and attacking pests, if we're going to be taking and we're going to be going after, let's just say the insects, for instance, if we're going to be going after these things and you're of the impression that organic is the 100% best way to go, I'm not going to argue with you on that. Will not argue with you because organic gardening is just uber awesome when it's done right. But you also have to remember that if you're going to use a soapy concoction like I talked about earlier, if you're going to use potassium salts, if you're going to use neem oil, if you're going to use pyrethroids, if you're going to use all these things that are considered natural and or organic, did you know you're killing the good bugs too? Yeah. So you can't come out and you can't bring out uh, for instance, some good bugs to eat the bad bugs and then come by and spray everything because you're going to kill all of the good bugs. Lace wings, for instance, you're going to take those. They Man, they do a lot of damage to the bad bugs. But the second you go spraying some spinosa on them, they're goners. So you have to think about the approach that you're going to take in this whole big scheme of gardening and I use the approach of integrated pest management. If you <laughs> if you have limited growing areas, I was on a I was on a landscape consultation. It was actually kind of funny because I went over there and and they wore masks. I wore masks. We kept our distance for the masks and all that kind of stuff. And uh, they basically had a, a a concrete backyard. And it was really kind of cool because I was able to direct the people to use the smart pots, those fabric containers. They are so cool. You can get them at, I believe, every every box store there is or go to smartpots.com. Something definitely to look into, okay? All right, so I'll tell you what. Let's uh, start getting our questions lined up over here. And if you want to write in, you could do so. Go to my website, uh, thingsgreen.com. There's a form on there that you could fill out, and we will get your question fielded. 
I recently started gardening in raised beds. I love the way the plants are easier to reach, but I am a little worried I won't be able to harvest my tomatoes. Won't they be too high? <laughs> yeah. Pam, how tall are our tomatoes? <laughs> okay. So we like to say that 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 Pam and Serena over here, they're they're fun size because they basically come up to my belly button. And <laughs> they they don't have a lot of height to them. And she even uses a, a step to sit in the chair that uh, she's throwing the chair around. Yeah, she actually uses a step to get into a chair so that she can reach the board. And and uh <laughs> so you gotta, you just gotta love the idea of that. You just really do. Well, for the record, my mom is only four, four eight now, four nine. Oh, she yeah, she's short. She's short. My dad was six two. Go figure that one out. Okay, so <laughs> when you have a situation like that, we have here at the Things Green dot com Botanical Gardens, we have our little community urban garden, and it's pretty rough looking. If you look at, uh, I believe it's the next TV show that we do, we expose a lot of the behind the scenes of what the place looks like. Normally we take and we have really tight shots and all that. Now nah, we just let it all hang out this time. We have a planter bed that's pretty tall. How tall does it come up to you? to your elbows at least like like, like that okay so it comes up to your elbows so it's a pretty tall one it's it's at least it's taller than the desk taller than the desk we know it's long bigger it's got to at least be 36 inches tall and inside of that garden it's a you know raised get bed we have coal tomato cages that are six feet tall so we have three feet and then we put another Six feet on top of that, of course, they go in a little bit to 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 uh, secure themselves. So we've got a tomato cages. We have three tomato cages that are upwards of over eight feet, close to 10 feet. I mean, nine feet. And uh, our yearly volunteer tomato, which is a cherry tomato, and it's a it's an orange tomato, isn't it? It's not a red one. It's well, usually they're kind of on the orange side, so it's like an orange, orange looking tomato. Anyway, yeah, we don't know because there's a red one too. Anyway, so this thing is such an aggressive plant. We've been we've been growing them for uh, for several years now. We just keep on recycling the plants that keep on growing up and 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 using that particular one. Anyway, so it's growing up tall and it's all in the cage right now. It's almost to the very tip tip top. So we're gonna take it and we're going to work it in and because i'm tall i can get in there and i could push the branches in so that they stay within the cage and then once they start shooting out through the center they're going to shoot up and they're going to flop back down they're going to grow downwards and they'll probably end up growing all the way down to the ground they usually do that anyhow don't they yeah they're going to grow all the way down to go so they're going to shoot up six feet tall they're going to come back down another six feet and then another three feet after that because they're pretty aggressive cherry tomato plants now this year we decided to plant on either side of these things we planted i don't even know what they are I don't know if they're their early boy, early girl. Oh, they're yeah, no, they're beef sticks. These are beef sticks. So those Pam, those are going to get really big. They're going to get the size of a softball. Really big tomatoes on there. So the plants are going to be probably not as tall to where they're they're going to be shooting through as much, but they will a little bit. They'll probably come out a couple of feet. But to answer your question, when you have a raised garden bed like that, you're going to have challenges now your raised garden bed is not as tall as ours i can guarantee you i'm not even have to ask you because you're probably just have you know maybe six inches eight inches 12 inches at the most you know that's even if it's at two feet it's really not that big of a deal but when you have tomatoes like you're talking about how are you going to harvest them Well, you need to put them in a sturdy cage to where they will grow up and through the cage and cascade over. Now, the nice thing, the nice part about cold tomato cages, they come in three different sizes. So just get a smaller cage so that it can come through and then 
it'll cascade down so you can get in there and you can pull and you can pluck as you need. Now, worst case scenario, you may want to get a step stool. I mean, if Pam can get a step stool to sit in her chair over there to do the to do the show, you can certainly get yourself a step stool to step into that and to get into the garden bed. You know, of course, you got to be careful. You don't want to trip. You want to make sure that, especially when you step in that soil, you never know if you're going to go down and how far you're going to go down. I can guarantee you this much. Can guarantee you this much. If you were to step into our garden bed, I'll bet you we would sink six inches. The soil that we have is so light and fluffy and airy. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool because that's all we do in this thing is just do the gardening end of it. That's all we do to it. And we fluff it up before it starts. What we do, we literally do this. We got a lot of, we've got a lot of volunteers in that thing. In fact, they did a whole TV show one year. Was it last year or the year before? It was all a volunteer garden. We didn't have to buy any seeds or nothing. Boom, there it was. Anyway, so since then, you have to take and you have to kind of fluff up the soil. We add new soil to it all the time. And that particular mix is light and airy and it drains well. You know, it has all the stuff that you really need to have when it comes to this type of a uh this type of a situation. So it it's it's nice. It's I mean it's really good for what we do. So I encourage you to do the same thing. Get that step stool if you want. Get whatever it is that you need so that you can connect and get into that garden. I mean, that's really, really what it boils down to. You're just going to have to get into that garden. And, you know, and it's like I said, it's a good thing. It's really, really a good thing. So I challenge you to do that. You're not going to have any problems. You may end up, you may, if you can't get into it, get somebody else. Put the taller stuff like in the front, possibly. I, I don't know how, how deep it is. You know, usually when you have a raised garden bed, it's not more than a couple of feet. That's so you could reach in and get it. So, you know, you got to work with this. If it matter, if it means high, if it means getting the kid next door to come in to pick your vegetables, by golly, have them do that and then give them a couple of tomatoes, give them some squash. You know, when you give away stuff like that. You would be surprised what happens. And what happens is that your vegetables seem to grow bigger, better, stronger, because there's plenty to go around. All right, we have to keep some house to do some house cleaning chores over here. I don't want you to go anywhere. I have more information and ideas for the beginning and seasoned gardener. When we return. All right, we're back. Thank you very much for tuning into this hour of the program. I'm Nick Federoff. Nick Federoff on gardening over here. Okay, here's a que- here's not a question. Here is a suggestion and that's what we're all about over here we're sharing the love uh t writes in saying why not get a big pot to put next to the raised bed that you grow it in and then you should be able to reach the tomatoes that way that's solved absolutely solved right there and the ironic ironic part about it is you don't need a huge pot you can do this with like a 15 gallon size container and you know what's really interesting about 15 gallon size containers Actually, all the containers nowadays, they are starting to come in different circumferences. So you can get what they call a, well, we used to call them this way in the business. Uh, there was five gallon size containers, then they made seven gallon size, and then the seven gallon size, they ended up making them squatty. So we call it, we used to call them uh, a, a seven squat. So you can get a 15 squat. A squatty container, it's not as tall, but it is still the same 
dimensions on the inside of the container as far as the amount of volume is concerned. So that's a really good thing right there. And hey there, want to say hello to Dr. Sonia. You moved to Texas. What happened? Oh, man, been doing well, thank you. We'll have to catch up at another time. All right, so we're talking gardening and landscaping over here. Let's find out what else is on your gardening mind over here. I would like to start watermelon seeds, zucchini, tomatoes, corn, squash, and tomatoes. Is it too late to sow in small potting containers? Also, I have peat moss, which I purchased last year. What is it for, and how can I use it to help my garden? Ooh, that was a double whammy quest. You see the way where they worked that in? Oh, she was slick. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's You kind of opened up a Pandora's box right there because I could talk about both these things so, so much. Okay. It's never, I don't, I, I always like to do this. It's never too late to plant. And sometimes it's never too early to plant. As long as your weather conditions are favorable and you've got at least a three-month window that you think you can grow something, then go ahead and do it. When in doubt, don't grow anything that you get a fruit or a vegetable on. For instance, if it's really late in the season, don't grow squash because you're not going to get any. Don't grow tomatoes because you're probably not going to get any. You know, most people have uh, what they call a winter, spring, summer, and fall. Here at the Things Green Botanical Gardens, it is spring all year round. We are harvesting strawberries in November, December, October, and most people can't do that. They just can't do that, okay? So when you have a winter, spring, summer, and fall, it's best to try to follow your farmer's almanac, if you may, to go, okay, well, in spring, we need to start our sets. And by the time, actually, late winter, early spring, you could start your sets in, in little containers, and then you can bring them up, and you can do things with them. And I'm okay with that. I think that's a really good deal. Uh, when you start getting later on in the season, starting them from seed is kind of a little bit on the difficult side. So, therefore, what I'd rather have you do is go to your local nursery, stimulate the economy, and plant by sets. Already grown plants. This way, you have circumvented planting and waiting for the seeds to get up to that point where they have any size on them. So plant in sets. You can buy some plants already in a one-gallon-sized container. And, I mean, those things are just ready to hop, and sometimes they even have fruit on them. So go ahead and plant those things. Just be careful that if you do plant them and we're a little bit too late on it, you may not get anything. But why not do the best of both worlds? Plant some seeds, get some sets, plant those. I mean, it's really, it's really simple when you think about that. So go ahead and do that. Now, the thing that's not simple happens to be the peat moss, because peat moss has some interesting characteristics to it. I am not a huge fan fan of peat moss. I don't mind if you use it. It's really, really good when it's used properly. And what I mean by properly is that if you have peat moss that's a year old, and it has dried out, and I see this all the time, you'd probably better just maybe putting it into a compost pile. I almost said throw it away, but peat moss is expensive. Peat moss comes from bogs. And when you have a bog, when, and a bog plant is always in water. And being that it's always in water, and peat moss is great for, for water retention. Oh, the water retention is just outrageous. And it's also uber awesome for acidifying your soil. And most of our plants have to be on the acidic side in the first place. The problem that we have is that once peat moss dries, good luck getting it wet again. I don't want to say it's impossible. It's nearly impossible. It's really tough for that to happen. So 
when you think about it in that particular fashion, why would you want to use it? Because we never water our plants like we say we're going to water them. You know how I know this? Because you're asking me to fix your plants all the time. So they dry out. It just happens. Hey, you know, whatever. Now, many peat moss companies are putting wetting agents inside of the peat moss. That's okay, but the wetting agent also has a lifespan to it. So if you could use a rich, well-draining soil that has a little bit of peat moss, it's better than using it if it has a strong presence of peat moss. I'll be back after this. All right, we're back over here, ladies and gentlemen. This is Nick Federoff on Gardening, where we talk about gardening, landscaping, and I help you out with all of your indoor and outdoor living ideas. Okay, let's do this over here. Uh, Let's talk gardening. My Birds of Paradise recently released a new leaf, and it's twisted. Should I open it up myself, or should I leave it and wait to see if it opens up on its own? (laughs) Okay, you know what this, you know, you know what that really interests me about this question? You have a lot of different plants and uh, like Defenbachia. Great question. Dumpkin. Beautiful, beautiful indoor house plant. Poisonous, but still beautiful. And you have plants like this. Birded Paradise. Well, the plants look like. The leaves are rolled up like they took newspapers and they just rolled them up. And especially when they start coming out, you would think like exactly what, what, what she's thinking about. Do you take and you open them up? No, you don't want to do that. You want nature to allow the plant to open up on its own. So even though it looks like a, a rolled up newspaper, it's a, I saw that yawn, by the way. Those real, thank you for trying to hide it. It was good. Because the second she starts yawning, I start yawning. And then we end up having a yawn fest, and then there's no more radio show. But that was a good one, Pam. <laughs> so anyway, what'd you do, party last night too much? It's not like you can go anywhere. <laughs> so, anyway, so when you have a leaf that is rolled up that's probably the nature of it now here's the exception to the rule let's just say you have something like a ficus nitida or you have a ficus benjamina either one of those two they're they're in the same family they kind of resemble each other everybody knows what a ficus plant is the ficus benjamina has the one that has more of a longer tip on it than the other well these two ficus they get an insect called thrips and thrips are sucking insects and sucking insects will slurp the juices out and will curl the leaves. But that's not until after, from before. I mean, they're they're open already. And then they'll suck at the, and then they'll like the, And when you open them up, you'll actually see the insect inside. So in this particular case, when you have the Strelitzia or the Bird of Paradise, as, yeah, that's what it's called, Strelitzia, Strelitzia Regine. So there was, and this, you know what? There's another one called the Strelitzia Nicolai. <laughs> That's me, Nikolai. Okay, the Strelitz in Nikolai is the giant bird of paradise. You know, it has those huge leaves that get five feet tall, kind of like they almost resemble a banana tree, but they're not. Anyway, so these plants, when they open up, they're curled up at first. I don't want you to take and I don't want you to uh, help them out. Allow nature to help them out. We could talk later about insect activity. My aloe vera plant is dying. I've had it for about a week now, and it's been getting worse. The leaves are now starting to flatten and droop. 
This is my first aloe, and I don't really have any experience. Will it recover? Okay. Sounds pretty classic, where you buy a plant from a nursery, and you bring it home, and you start having problems with it right away. That's because the nursery has grown them in a controlled environment. The second you take it home, you're like a wild person. Well, actually, your environment's a wild person to the plant, and it needs to acclimate itself. And being that the aloe vera, which, you know, I got to tell you, it's kind of like a dandelion. You look at it wrong, and it's going to grow. But the problem with this one is that uh, we normally give it a little too much TLC. So the plants are going to fold over. They're going to fold down a bit. And when they fold down a bit, uh, the plant could get crown rot and rot away on you. So look at the best part about an aloe vera plant is even if you do get some crown rot on it and it does rot. Let's just say you took and you rotted away the whole plant, the whole plant rotted away. You can actually take that plant, what's left of it, and replant it. Just snip it off where the bad part is. Let it callous up on a sink for a couple of days and then just stick it in some soil deep enough so it doesn't fall over. It'll probably reroot. But the case of what's happening here, I believe, is you probably have a combination of not being acclimated to where you're having it, to where it was before, and probably just a little bit too much water. So I think at this particular point, just knock off the watering. Let it dry out. And then you can water it again. In fact, I would actually take and fertilize it afterwards. Afterwards, your next watering, not this one. Fertilize it with some AgroThrive. And the AgroThrive being that it's a just a beautiful organic fertilizer. It'll bathe those plants. It'll bathe the roots. And it'll help it grow so much better. All right, I'll be back right after this. I am Nick Federoff, and you're listening to Nick Federoff on Gardening, live from the thingsgreen.com Botanical Gardens. All kinds of critters would love to destroy your yard. Now you can repel them with Repelzol from Bonide. Repelzol contains natural ingredients to control more than a dozen animals for up to two months. Guaranteed. Apply it to trees, shrubs, perennials, lawns, and more. It even stops animals from chewing on fences. Get Repelzol from Bonide, the name you can trust with nearly 100 years of experience in lawns and gardens all across America. Learn more at Bonide.com. Technology moves at the speed of innovation, and today, that's lightning fast. So when you get your hands on the latest tech, don't forget to do the right thing with your old devices. Recycle them. The Consumer Electronics Association and its members are making recycling your old tech device as easy as purchasing new ones. Just go to greenergadgets.org, type in your zip code, and you'll instantly find the responsible recycling location closest to your home. You'll also find lots of tips to simplify your recycling, like asking the store where you buy your new TV if they'll haul away your old one. Television sets, video game consoles, smartphones, tablets, they're all recyclable. Don't let them clog up your local landfill. Just visit greenergadgets.org. You're sharp enough to get the latest tech tools into your home. Now be responsible enough to get your old devices to the recycler. That's greenergadgets.org. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. This is fun. I didn't think I'd like kayaking. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. But I think it's time to head back in. Okay. Can we come back? Sure. Tomorrow? <laughs> Let's check with Mom. 
Hey, be careful getting out of the boat. It's a kayak, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to return the kayak. Just make sure you have everything. Yep. Can we walk home? How about a taxi? 233 North Maple, please. It's a short fare from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a neighborhood park or green space near you. Also, find fun activities to do like boating and biking or camping and hiking. Plus, much more. It's all right in your naturehood. Best day ever. A public service announcement brought to you by the Ad Council and the U.S. Forest Service. Let's do it over here. Nick Federoff on gardening, and we're talking gardening and landscaping. Yeah, Steve writes in, and he's asking, what's your favorite potting mix? What is your favorite potting mix? That's a good question. (laughs) I have used so many different types of potting mixes in my life, all the way from the ones from the uh, UC system uh, and and uh, the ones that, that every person can ever imagine, the different types of mixes that are available. And I come to find out that I'm a big believer that soils, because one of my fortes when I was in college was soils, and I really believe that the soil, I mean, it is a living organism. We have to treat it as such. And we have to understand that there are certain components that are necessary to have a rich, well-draining soil. And here's the problem with that. Rich, well-draining to you, Steve, is not necessarily the same for me or for the next person or even the plants. Because we do know that certain plants take different types of mixes. So I guess what I'm trying to get here is that if the truth was known, if you're going to use a soil mix, use something that you're comfortable with using. You do have to try them because, you know, you go down to the, you go down to the nursery, you can buy a soil mix that's for $3 a cubic, uh, uh, for a two cubic foot bag or say a one cubic foot bag. But you could turn around, you can get another one that's seven, eight dollars for the same one cubic foot bag. Is one better than the other? Maybe, maybe there's more vermiculite, perlite, shaving, sand, topsoil, things like that in it, as opposed to the other one. Maybe not. Maybe the other guy just has a better marketing thing. You know, maybe they do. Uh I have used for many years, and they're not paying for, me, for this right now for me. I have used the Miracle Grow. What's it called? Moisture Control. I've used Moisture Control for a lot of years. It's a very expensive stuff, though. It's very expensive. There's other there's other stuff that are equally as good, uh, you know. And and but I've used that because I've just used it. It's, you know, you go down, you buy it, and you use it. It's one of those things. But anyway, it's just it's. It's a trial and error kind of thing. Now, the last couple of times that I've done things on TV, I actually just mixed soils together, different compost. I even used paper mulch recently. There's a company that takes paper. They don't make mulch out of it. They actually make a a growing medium out of it. And I threw it all together with some agricultural diatomaceous earth. Man, stuff is growing like crazy. So it's all trial and error. And for Michelle... You got to call in to get your pencil. All right, this is Nick Federoff on gardening.